Hey guys, welcome back. Rinaldi Studio here, and welcome to the very first edited content video on YouTube. And what I planned to do was to start trimming down our live stream content into much shorter and more um, specific informational how-to videos for you guys. So I'm gonna start with episode 81, which utilized the P61, which is a good place to start. And it just kind of showcases when I get prepped for a session, whether it's the first or the 10th session, doesn't matter. Uh, I go through references, I refresh myself, I get myself kind of warmed up mentally for what's about to happen with the patina and the weathering that I want to you know, process out uh, on the model itself. And I'll look at various photos, I'll look at you know related vehicles, uh, in this case an A20 uh, night fighter as well, and just kind of looking at the splatter spray and, and how the, the, the panel lines pick up the grease and the oils. And I'm going to use this information as I as I process the weathering on my own model as it is. I'm going to look at you know photos that are kind of give me also the story or at least a, a a life basis of this is what I want my machine to look like. And so I'm going to look at relative you know details and, and stains and splatters and, and discolorations and, and relate that to my project. Uh, and this project's been going on for a little while, and what I'm going to do is every time I sit down um, on a fresh session, on a brand new session, um, all the paint and surfaces dry and everything, nothing's going to get harmed here. But I, I put a thin coat of, of, of my thinner on first just to kind of kick down the, the surface tension a little bit. And when I apply my oils here, where I start to work with the light beige and the light olive drabs and stuff on this on the surface that I want to add a little bit more tint and a little bit more variation to, that first pass of the thinner just lets us get a little bit further along with much lower risk in the very beginning. It's important when you sit down to weather in particular that you mentally are in your game. You mentally are ready for this. Um, and it's one quick way to get kicked out of that is if you have a problem right out of the gate. It's extremely frustrating. So this is a little bit about similar to when you go to the gym to work out and exercise. It's kind of a mental warm up a little bit. And there is a little bit of the warm up with your hands and your brushes and getting kind of familiar again. And what I like to do with my weathering, um, in particular with OPR, is I tend to build up my layers in a light to dark pattern. And the reason I do that is, you know, military vehicles in particular, especially World War II, um, they didn't come out of the factory with a civilian type clear coat over the paint. You know, most matte paint in the military vernacular is a straight raw paint. And so Mother Nature is going to do its thing pretty quickly. Um, by pretty quickly, within a couple of weeks to a couple of months, uh, lots of stuff starts to happen, especially when it's, you know, multiple 10, 15 sorties, five, six sorties a day type of thing with aircraft and, and what Mother Nature will do. And, on, you know, these are these are usually frontline airfields, you know, in the dirt on top of everything else half the time. So I want to build up contrast. I want to increase the kind of storytelling elements that I'm working with on this particular projects. Um, it's pretty far along, but I'm, I'm just doing some extra tinting, some extra grease parameters between some panel breaks and, and looking at my other stuff and evaluating myself and saying, okay, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go with this. And then I've got certain colors on this olive drab. I've got, you know, D-Day stripes that were painted over. I've got a darker olive drab to the left there. And I'm trying to gradate this flap system out a little bit more and it was just kind of a warm up in the stream to kind of get myself going a little bit. And when you work with the oils, you can see here, um, one of the key elements to really pay close attention to throughout this video and others uh, and in the books is the amount of thinner being used is the critical kind of uh, fulcrum, if you will. To deal with oil paints in particular, and I've said this uh, many times and to reinforce this thought is the thinner, that little cup that you see in the upper right hand corner there, thinner, is your volume control. And that blender brush and or when you're mixing on, on the paintbrush itself, the amount of thinner that goes in there in the ratio of amount of paint that's being used is really where the volume, and by volume I mean opacity versus transparency. And that's what I'm talking about with the volume and it's all controlled by how much thinner is going down. And the reason this is a critical part of oil paint rendering is it's the only chemical process we have for this task that starts at 100% pure out of the tube. It's not a pre-thin chemical. And that's a major change from how a lot of the pre-thinned enamels process weathering for us in some sort of convenience package. 
Truth is oil paint rendering is far more convenient. It's far more efficient. You set up your palette. You can use that palette for, you know, six to eight weeks. If you, if you put it in the freezer, when you're done with your sessions, the paints won't dry out. They're on the cardboard ready to go when you're ready to go. Um, the amount of paint that you use is extremely small. It's very efficient. It's non-toxic. Uh, and there's solvent thinners out there or, and or thinners out there that will act in the solvent manner that are non-toxic as well. Uh, and here I'm using a, a bunch of products from Gamblin, which is a Portland, a local to me, Portland oil paint company that takes this very seriously. Uh, I paint over an acrylic base coat and I don't use solvents in my work at all anymore. And that's for my health. And I do that on purpose. And OPR follows in line with that. And the pre thinned enamels don't. You know, they're just, you know, the, you open up a, a jar of pre thinned enamel and every one of you knows exactly what I'm talking about that have experienced this. It's an unpleasant experience along with a lot of other stuff because those vapors do damage as well, believe it or not. <clears throat> so that said, you know, my purpose here is really to, I want to weather the boom up and I've got weathering that I've already done over here. So I'm, I'm kind of tip checking myself. I'm, I'm gauging what's going on between both color breaks and location breaks and oil paint rendering the way I teach it, the way I've explained it to everybody. The purpose of rendering out the surfaces like that is to move section by section is to complete each section to as far along as you feel comfortable with i'd say 90 to 100 percent complete on each section to move to the next section and in this way it's very much like writing you know people ask about that process well it's just like writing a book if you're like an author or fiction you go chapter by chapter by chapter you have an overall game plan of what's going on with character character development and then you work chapter by chapter page by page that's what opr is i'm working page by page here and I'm finishing that page and I'm moving on. And that's what this is. And the reason for that is, is multiple. The first part is I get an outstanding representation of what the model is going to be doing as it nears the finish line. So if I do overall steps in the old classic way to do things, I never have an idea what's going on. And I did that for 10 years as a professional. So I'm very well versed in what happens when you go around a model and you step one, Go around the model do step two and it's <laughs> you know it just it's never talked about in this hobby and the truth of the matter is when you go section by section when you embrace this concept you can see right there on 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 camera i can see what the, the the other boom looks like fully weathered out i have a great idea what's going on and what that does the purpose of that or i should say the the end result of that is is you're happy about that. You're mentally prepped for the next step. You are engaged with this model and you're excited about it because you can see what the heck is going on. That's a powerful tool that just is not proffered in this hobby anywhere else. It's always this, this old school step by step stuff. And frankly, and we'll get into the pin wash here in a little bit in the conversation about capillary action and, and how to how to go about that. But that what that does is that framework that we're, we were used to doing that OPR no longer follows it's too restrictive. It's too struck down in terms of you must follow this and you must buy a bottle A, B, C, and D because that's the only way to do this. And the truth is, <laughs> no, no, it's not, my friends. And, and let me explain to you how. And I've been doing OPR since 2011 when I, when I first brought this out to the hobby in that I wanted a system. I was after a system that was efficient that I can apply to any subject, any model, any scale at any point in time in the process. And that little palette, that little cup of thinner, and these brushes are all you need. It is hyper efficient. You're in total control. And the purpose of that is each machine is unique, like a fingerprint. Each weathering that you do on a machine is unique. It doesn't matter what it is. And you need that flexibility so that you can go from project to project to project and horizontal stabilizer to port side wing to starboard side wing in full 100% control. Using your references as a guide. This is how this works. So when you're trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I advance my weathering skills? How do I advance past what I'm used to seeing or what I'm used to doing? Well, that's what oil paint rendering is all about, is to give you that technique to do that with. And the simplistic uh, description of it is you're applying oil paints in really small amounts. The colors relate directly, directly to the project. In this case, it's, it's a faded olive drab. So I'm using some beiges and some, some, old, some olive greens that are, that are toned down desaturated out a little bit to fit the military vernacular and then I'm using my brushes to apply in a light to dark layering process. So to repeat that is basically I go through and I apply a light layer of, of paint. What I'm doing is I'm oxidizing the paint, I'm fading the paint or I'm embedding that paint with a lot of dust. 
That's typically what happens to the real machines in the real world. Then from there, I go into some middle tones and start adding some more distress and patina into the paint further and further in a very precise manner. And the beauty of this, and you can see the bristles dance along the surface here, is that a paintbrush bristle is far more precise than an airbrush needle. And even in the most fine airbrushing and the most you know, talented airbrush artist, you can still out paint with a paintbrush in OPR to get you a, a, a level higher of grittiness that is replicating what you see in the photos far, far better with a lot more efficiency. Uh, you know, heavy airbrush work is its own, <laughs> you know, demon, if you will. So being able to do this with oil paints is, is, is a, a fantastic opportunity for us and I've embraced it fully. <clears throat> and then from there, as we move up kind of that conversation a little bit as I'm developing these things, as you can see here, I, you know, adjust the paint with the thinner. It's not coming off the brush quite the way I want. Do a little dab in the thinner. And one of the fundamental processes of oil paint rendering is a paper towel that you see underneath there. And the reason I use a white paper towel is because I can see exactly what's going on uh, with the paint on the brush. Because when you, when you touch the paper towel, it will tell you, is the paint too wet? Is it too dry? If I want to get it dry, like a, for dry brushing or scruffiness, like you see here, I touch it to the paper towel and I can quickly judge what it's doing on the fly instantaneously. In fact, I have to slow everything down for filming and teaching of the purpose. When you get into the actual flow of it, I could probably, you know, weather this horizontal stabilizer section here in about five to 10 minutes, realistically. So that's kind of its power at the end of the day and what, what's happening with it. And then as I continue on, in, and or you're continuing on, is, is that you should be evaluating your project, you should be evaluating the colors, you should be looking, okay, what am I doing? How am I doing this? How is this going? Okay, I need to do this. Well, let's put some some other stuff down. Well, another way to do that is with speckling, because what happens is you need slight discoloration all through the paint. And again, this is what kind of the, a lot of pre-shading is, is about. Whereas with the speckling, you can you do this kind of post, and in truth, you get a lot more control out of it. And you get a little bit more in scale uh, ref, uh, reflection out of that. The point of what I'm doing here is I've been speckling for probably close to two decades now. Is that the reason I do it this way, the reason I use a brush and I flick it from a very close distance from the surface is it maximizes my ability to control those speckles and where I want them to go uh, much better than say if I was to spray that paint with like a, you know, the tip of that brush with an airbrush to splatter that paint. So speckling in and of itself is very powerful if you understand kind of the better way to achieve kind of the looks what you're trying to do. And it's a, it's a variation of spots and stains that also by blending, you can control both its opacity uh, or and or translucency so you can you can develop out during those steps a greater level of age in the weathering weathering in and of itself just pure weathering what is weathering what is the definition of weathering well weathering is basically the age of the machine you're weathering time and the reason this becomes an important factor into this as i review kind of what i'm doing here is nothing happens in one day to anything so you have to you have to weather up basically months of operation in a very short amount of time at your at your workbench, and then how do you achieve that effectively? Well, speckling is one of those 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 arrows in your quiver that you really can can lean on for that because it will give you older stains, you know, more translucent stains, and then it will give you more opaque stains, and then you follow along that path. Same thing you do with the brush when you do an actual direct application on there. Same basic principles between transparency and opacity. So here you can see moving to the to the back side of the elevator here and going with the darker olive drab to match the color that I'm working on a little bit better is I'm see how thick that paint is towards the end of that that edge there. Well, I want that opacity through there. And then as I move inward, I want less opacity. I want more translucency. And so I'm developing that on the brush with the thinner and then I'm coming in with the blender and I'm going to stipple that out. So that process one two swing of laying that paint down then coming in and blending it out is how this works from, from the fundamental technique point of view. Now it's a lot to take in if you've never seen this before, or if you've never done this before, if you're, you're new to this whole idea. And those of you that are not, and you've been around a little while, this should reinforce for you guys quite a bit about kind of what's been happening with OPR and then how do you, you know, really attend to it yourself privately when you're doing it yourself at the bench with the model and your own references and your own kit, kit, et cetera, et cetera. Those are important pieces to this. You know, it's one thing to sit there and watch on YouTube or read it in the pages of a book and stuff like that, but 
when you have to go and do it yourself, that trepidation that, that creeps in, that self-doubt, that lack of confidence, or you haven't done this a lot, so you're not really sure. Well, what you're seeing here to reinforce this concept even further is that this is a complete test model. This P61, it's not going to a show, it's not going to, it's not going to books, it's not going anywhere. This is just to illustrate how to do this. And it's also a proof of concept so I can showcase the transition from, because most of you know me for armor and stuff like that. Well, how does this work in other subject matter? It's the same conversation. So I use test models all the time to reinforce my skill set, to improve myself. Self-improvement is a big part of this. I'm always thinking in the next step, what's coming next? Well, with OPR and then working on test subjects like this, I can really stretch out those legs a bit and come up with a much better you know, project down the road because I don't want the model I did five years ago to look like the model I did today. I'm always looking at kind of where I can, can move myself in that barometer of, of, of judgment, so to speak, and kind of push things along. And that's what this a part of it, what you're seeing here is all about. I'm using the stream build as, as kind of my big, you know, testing environment to kind of come in and say, okay, well, I want to do this, I want to do that. And, and those of you that participated for the last couple of years with this and witnesses is you're seeing a whole bunch of myself trying to seek the next plateau. And, and it's just the power of OPR. It's almost endless. I. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm scratching the surface with it, and no pun intended, but it, it really kind of is in that vernacular of it's, it really is limitless and it's only limited by us. It's in and of itself, the limits are really, really small. Like in other words, or what should I say? The limits are really there other than those of what we put on it. You know, we're the only ones that limit this stuff. So let me just loop back around to the, um, <clears throat> the panel line conversation, capillary action. And one of the things or principles with weathering that when you study your subject matter closer and closer and closer, uh, in particular with vehicles that use a skin surface over a frame, such as aircraft, um, predominantly, the way the kit manufacturers have represented that in most cases is a small trench on the surface. And so it becomes kind of de facto that we'll start putting in thin chemicals via capillary action in, in, in you know, smooth gloss varnishes to get that action to happen for us. Truth of the matter is that's not how vehicles look. That's not, especially in particular aircraft. And, and there's some cases where it does happen more than others for sure. But as a guideline, as a, as a general rule of thumb, it doesn't. What OPR allows us to do then at this point in time is to come in and recreate exactly what's going on with your panel lines. And what I mean by that is not to knock the hobby down in any way, shape or form, but it's just open the eyes up a little bit like, hey guys, Putting a dark panel line across every single groove on the model surface isn't what's going on in the real world. And if you're trying to achieve certain looks, when you start to do that, when you lean on capillary action as your primary tool, you put yourself into a corner that is difficult to get out of. The reason I do like to dark is it gives me maximum flexibility and options down the road. If I go in dark from the start in every single panel line, 90% of them I'm screwed on because I can't undo that. I can't go out and go light if I need to dust or if I need to fade or some of the panel lines just don't show up on aircraft. You just don't see them no matter what people say. And so if you play that up visually here, which is what you're seeing me do right now, is I'm not hitting every single one of them. But as I pump up the darkness and the opacity and the light to dark conversation here, full control, full authorship of what's happening here, I now can represent the actual one-to-one -one in miniature much more effectively and extremely efficiently. I'm not beholden to some pre thin chemical that I've got to modify to get it to do what I want it to do. Oil paint started 100% and I can go from 100% down to zero every single brush stroke however I want to do it on the fly instantly with this palette and this cup of, of, of thinner right there and the, and the paper towels and, a, and a three or four brushes in my hand. So think about that as you guys begin this journey, or if you're 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 kind of learning this and wanting to continue your journey with oil paint rendering, think about those things. Um, for those that are interested in kind of the tools and the paints, uh, the paints you're seeing here are mostly Gamblin, which is again is a Portland-based oil paint company. I'll put a brief description in, in you know in terms of a list of colors, just kind of you know, it's only four or five six colors here in play because uh, the color scheme itself is pretty pretty singular in and of its own thing. So. Um, and then I'll put a, a link for the brushes if you guys want to uh, get yourself some of the brushes that I use. Uh, and if you're if you're if you're unfamiliar, um, the company King Art, which is an American um, art company, makes a really nice line of brushes that used to be Loa Cornell, which is the red brush here that you see in front of me, and it's now called King Art uh, Original Gold Golden Taclon Series. So um, all these things are avail readily available. I'll put links in the description uh, down for you guys. 
and hopefully these kind of early conversations right now, even though we've been streaming for a while and, and, and those kind of things, just as I condense this information down for you, uh, hopefully it's a little bit easier to dissect. And, and there's going to be some camera issues occasionally because the, the camera that I'm using goes, it, it's my cell phone that goes through a webcam app that really neuters the iPhone's capabilities. And so there is a little bit of that. So these are 1080p, unfortunately, right now uh, in terms of edited stream content. Um, as much as I want to do 4K streaming, um, it's just not supported with, with the devices that I have. So apologies for a slight blurriness in the camera sometimes, but um, be that as it may, the information is relevant to, to hopefully quite a few of you, uh, and you and you get quite a bit out of this. So thanks again, uh, and we will see you on the next one.